Greetings, Presbyterian Church of Dover. This is our second week together doing virtual worship. Uh, as you can see, I've moved from the sanctuary. Now I'm in the church's library. Last week we noticed with the empty sanctuary, the audio was very echoey and rather distracting to try to listen to. So we've moved here. Now we will have a prelude in just a moment that comes from the sanctuary. You'll be able to see the sanctuary during the prelude. But uh, glad you're here watching today, participating in this worship service. Next Sunday, we're going to do virtual communion as part of our worship service. And it's what it's a B O Y B C. Bring your own bread and cup. And uh, we will go through the worship service here. I will bless the bread and the cup, and you will partake of it in your in the safety of your homes. And uh, so we'll we'll be doing that next Sunday, the first Sunday of the month. I like to begin every worship service with a uh, with this: Whoever you are and wherever you are on your faith's journey, you are welcome here this morning from wherever you're viewing this. And I pray that the transforming love of Jesus might touch your life today. So we're going to have our prelude now. And during the prelude, as you listen to the music, invite God to speak to you through, during our worship time. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 116, the first seven verses of the psalm. Listen as I read. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompass me. The pangs of Sheol lay hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then... I called on the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I pray, save my life. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord protects the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O oh my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. Let us pray. We gather now to worship you, O oh God. We gather to praise your name and to find peace and rest in you. And while we might be apart physically, we are together in spirit. And as a church, we, we call on you to be at work in us and through us. And we'd ask that you might speak to our hearts this day as we listen to your voice speaking to us. It is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. 
Our scripture lesson for today comes from Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 25. This is part of the, the resurrection story, the Easter story of Jesus. And it reads this way. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes, eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He answered them, What things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us they went to the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a, seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer, suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it's almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were open, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered there. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. In many of the cases when in these resurrection stories that we have, when Jesus appears to his followers, they don't immediately recognize him. And, and I kind of know what that's like. You know, there are times when I will bump into somebody somewhere at the grocery store or, or somewhere, and I recognize the face, but I can't put a name and the face together. And it's sitting there and it's driving me nuts, and I'm thinking, where do I know this person from? And my mind's just twirling, going through the catalog of different places where I should know someone. You know, was it a church? Not, certainly not a regular attender. I would recognize those people, but maybe someone that has visited occasionally or who knows. Or is it at one of the places where I would volunteer, Habitat for Humanity or the Talbot Interfaith Shelter, places in Easton at my old church where I volunteered? Or was it in places uh, like the gym where I'd go and work out or uh, somehow connected with the karate lessons that I was taking or, or maybe it was within the circle of my wife's friends and acquaintances. But somewhere I knew I knew them somehow. And sometimes we'd enter into a conversation and I'm hoping that somehow this conversation will give me a clue as to how I know them. So I don't blame the disciples or the followers of Jesus not recognizing Jesus. Because I will tell you, in all my trying to figure out where I know someone, my brain never takes me to the cemetery. I have never once 
seeing someone that I thought I knew that was dead. You, you just don't plan on that. You don't, that it's not even cross your mind. This side of heaven, we're not going to see someone alive who was dead. So, like I said, I don't blame the disciples, but Luke offers us, I believe, this humorous story of, um, of these two people that encounter what I call the incognito Jesus, the Jesus that is not recognized. And, uh, and they're walking the, the seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus, the, the Passover is over, the Sabbath is now also over, and people are starting to leave Jerusalem. And as they make this journey, I imagine they're walking fairly slowly, and they're talking amongst themselves of, of Jesus and what had happened that weekend. For it wasn't only Jesus who had been crucified and died. So it was with their hopes and their dreams also. For they had bet on the wrong Savior. And the one that they thought would redeem Israel was now dead. And with that was their hopes and their dreams for the future. And so they're discussing death, but it's a part of them that has also died. And, and now it seems that it's their lives are going toward fate rather than toward destiny. And and they are spent. They're at their wits end. They're they're exhausted. Uh, uh, physically and emotionally, perhaps financially, definitely spiritually, um, it's, it's over. And they, they are re will be returning to their work, whether it's the fishing nets or the tax collector booth or the fields or wherever it is that they, they made their, their living, they return that and hope that hopefully somehow mercifully they'll be able to forget and put their lives back together with whatever comes next. And so while they're having this discussion, a stranger catches up with them. And uh, the stranger listens in for a moment to hear what they're talking about. And then he asks, what are you talking about? And, and, I, and, and, and these two guys who've been walking along just come to a complete stop. And, and they look at Jesus and it's like, are you the only person in all of Jerusalem that doesn't know what happened this weekend? And Jesus, whom they're not recognizing, this incognito Jesus says, no, tell me. And so they begin to tell him about Jesus. How they saw him as the prophet, perhaps the Messiah, the one who's come to redeem Israel. But the chief priests and the Romans they conspired together to have Jesus crucified. And if that wasn't enough, some of the women of their following had gone to the tomb early that morning and the body was gone. And they said they saw a vision of angels that told them that Jesus was alive. But they were just hysterical women. You know, they didn't know what they were saying. Peter and John, they rushed to the tomb. And they too found it was empty. And so the question becomes, who would rob the tomb of the body of Jesus? Would the religious authorities stoop so low as to steal the body? What? possible reason with the Roman soldiers that were gathered at the tomb, why would they steal the body? Certainly it wasn't any of us followers of Jesus. We would have no reason. But the body was gone. And so a, a word that would describe, I think, these two men as they walked was confusion. What is going on? And so then Jesus begins to speak. And he calls them foolish, and, uh, and, and it's like uh, slow to believe, and it's like, I don't think I'd want to be called that if I was those two men. But then he, Jesus begins to explain the scriptures to them, and they're having a Bible study with Jesus. Can you imagine that? 
uh, Jesus explaining the scriptures to you. And he starts with Moses, works his way through the prophets, sharing with them how the Messiah, the Christ, would need to suffer, die, and then be raised up. This was totally foreign to these two men. Um, the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior, would not suffer. That's not in their comprehension, much less die and then be raised up. And so they're listening to him, and they're obviously intrigued by this stranger. And when they get to uh, uh, the, the end of the road to Emmaus, Jesus appears that he's going to go on, and they say, no, no, please, you got to stay. And they urge him, and they insist that he stay and spend the night with them and have supper. And uh, it's in the midst of this meal that Jesus breaks the bread and gives it to them. And it's all of a sudden, it's like, boom! They recognize who he is. It's Jesus. He is alive. And they've been talking to him all this time. And, oh, the questions they want to ask now, but in Luke's humor, Jesus disappears. And it's like, oh, no, we know we can't do it. We can't ask these questions now. But they're saying, didn't our hearts burn when he was talking to us? When he was opening the scriptures for us? And I imagine there was also, you know, I thought I recognized that face. I knew it from somewhere. I just couldn't figure out where. But now I know. And good news like this, you can't keep to yourself. And so even though they'd walked that seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus, they turned around and walked back. But I suspect it was at a much greater uh, clip of speed that they went back because they were now excited, passionate. Jesus is alive. And, and they get back to the other disciples. And they, they too were excited because Peter had seen Jesus alive. And, and so they knew that Jesus had been raised from the dead. You know, we're not told in these resurrection accounts in the four Gospels of Jesus ever appearing to a non-follower, a non-follower of Jesus. He just doesn't do it. Never shows up with any of them. If I'd been the risen Jesus, I would have been uh, knocking on Caiaphas' door and like, uh, let's let's talk a little bit about blasphemy now. Or I'd be there with Pilate, you know, maybe at the foot of his bed when he wakes up in the morning. You asked about truth. Let me tell you about truth. But he didn't do that. He just appeared to his own followers. And I think the reason he did that is because faith is, is, is uh, a funny thing that's difficult to prove, especially faith in the resurrection or faith in Jesus. You can pile on all the evidence you want, but it's all circumstantial. And... Uh, and people can choose to believe or not to believe. Uh, when with, with the mind, when it comes to faith, it's not so much like uh, appearing before a judge in a courtroom where all the evidence is weighed and you make a decision on that. It's more like an art lover going through an art gallery, looking at all the beautiful pieces of art that, that show our world as, as it is, but also gives us in a, a window to the world that's beyond this world. Uh, our Reformed faith says that, uh, that faith comes from God. We don't manufacture it ourselves, but it is a gift from the Holy Spirit. And so uh, this is uh, how, how we come to know, how we come to believe in the resurrected Jesus. The Holy Spirit reveals the incognito Jesus to us. And, uh, and not only that, that same Holy Spirit works to mold and shape us into the image of Christ, transforming our lives into what God wants us to be. But there are times when we really can't see Jesus. We don't see Jesus. The, the Jesus is incognito, and he may be around somewhere, but we don't know where. And it kind of reminds me of the poem, Foot, Footprints in the Sand. Perhaps you're familiar with it, where the author is in a dream, and she, uh, she and Jesus are walking down the beach, and their footprints are being left in the sand. And 
All the while they're walking, her life is, is flashing before her in the, in the sky. And, and they get there at the end, and she looks back, and there are certain places where there's only one set of footprints rather than two. And as she looked, it was in those difficult times of life with, uh, when things were diff or, or, or there were hardships and there were difficulties and, and perhaps doubts and depression and, and all these hard times. And she says, Jesus, why did you abandon me during these times? And he said, I never abandoned you. I carried you during those times. And so as we face difficult times, we need to recognize that Jesus is with us. During this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, Jesus is with us. There's another way we see the incognito Jesus, and we find this in Matthew chapter 25, in Jesus' parable of the sheep and the goats. And it's in this parable that Jesus says, <clears throat> whenever you fed me when I was hungry, whenever you clothed me when I was naked, whenever you visited me when I was alone or a stranger, welcomed me in as a stranger, whenever you visited me in prison, whenever you cared for the people who were least in society, we do it for Jesus. And so we need to, to learn to recognize that Jesus is in these people that we care for and that we help. And yet far too many Christians don't see Jesus in these people. And we do this at great peril to our own selves, according to the parable. So in this time of COVID-19, there are various places where we can see Jesus. Even though we're not in the sanctuary, we're not gathered together. When we go to the baptismal font, that's a place where we see Jesus where we welcome someone into the, in, into the new covenant of Christ's blood and his death and his resurrection, when we welcome them, in, welcome them in to the family of God. And we see Jesus at the communion table when we break the bread and we drink from the cup because it's there that we remember Christ died for us and it's there that we're proclaiming that story until he comes again. But as we just I mentioned, as I just mentioned in Matthew 25, it's Jesus when we care for those who are least in society. So let me suggest to you during this pandemic uh, where we are in lockdown, we can't be gathering together. When you make a phone call and you're calling to lift someone up or to encourage them or just to listen to them to see how they're doing, think, uh, think of it as you are you are talking with Jesus. And the flip side of that is true too. Those that are receiving the phone call. Think of those who are calling as the incognito. Jesus reaching out to you. The, for those who are able to um, do errands. Go to the grocery store. Or do some type of other errand. For those that are should not be out. Think of the people you're serving as the incognito Jesus. For those that are receiving that aid, think of the person doing it as the incognito Jesus. Healthcare workers, first responders, people who are having to work because they have essential services. Think of them as the incognito Jesus serving you. And I hope that they would view you as Jesus that they are serving. Jesus is here. Jesus is around us. If we only have eyes to see, ears to listen, and a heart ready to believe and willing to follow. So Jesus is alive and Jesus is here. And we can be his presence for others. And others can be his presence for us. So let us watch for the incognito of Jesus. Let us pray. O oh, gracious and loving God, give us eyes to see Jesus in our midst, ears to hear his voice when he speaks, and hearts that are open to believe. We would ask your protection during this COVID pandemic and that you might provide for all our needs. We think especially of those who are unemployed and whose money is running out. May we be the incarnate Jesus 
as we call others and offer them words of encouragement and love. We do pray for those who are most affected by this pandemic, the healthcare workers, the first responders, people that are doing, uh, are doing what is considered essential work, the government leaders, but especially the sick. We will pray for the sick and, and ask that, or pray for all of them and ask that you protect them. But we pray for healing for those who are sick, for comfort for those who are grieving the loss of a loved one. We ask for wisdom for the government leaders, protect and give stamina to the, first, the, health, the healthcare personnel and first responders. And we would ask that you be with our church while we can't be meeting together. May we still be reaching out and caring for one another. But we do pray for that time when we can safely gather together again. May that time come soon. Help us to be putting our faith into action that we might be the incognito Jesus to others. For we pray this in the name of Jesus and we offer up the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, thanks for watching. I hope this has been meaningful to you, encouraging uh, to you. And, and if it has, then invite family or friends to, uh, to watch it also. And uh, may God be with you. May, and for our benediction, may your eyes be open so that you see Jesus. May your ears be listening for the sound of his voice. And may your heart be willing to respond to his leading. Jesus is with us, even when we don't realize it, but we know that it is true. So go now in peace with the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen.